It has to do with the fact that in Brazil, when we started to deploy the internet, uh, we had no uh, models abroad. Actually, you had the US, you had some countries in, in the European Union, that's all. So that uh, actually we took some ideas from uh, the National Science Foundation Net, the Deutsche Forschung Netz, which is the research and academic network in, in Germany. And the rest we had to uh, invent or to adapt on our own. So uh, probably the fact that uh, somehow we, we did it right is the fact that I am here. I think it's, it was a mixture of uh, them all. I think the main problem uh, first uh, had to do with the fact that uh, if you wanted to introduce something new, there would always be uh, somebody or some uh, institutions against it because uh, it had to do with going against their interests or their activities. So I think uh, the main problem was the telecommunication system. Uh, in Brazil, which like in many countries, uh, used a different kind of uh, technical protocol, had a vested or open commercial interest. Uh, they, in many cases, uh, it was the case in Brazil as well, uh, they are actually invested by law uh, to do what they were doing. So that uh, somehow when you showed up and say we want to use a different protocol and we want to uh, deploy a competing service, you would be not only against their interests, but against the law. So I think that was the first problem. And second, in order for you to be successful in huge uh, uh, systems implementation, you need a breakthrough. And actually, you cannot plan a breakthrough. So that uh, you do what you, you think uh, you have to do, you, you, you get connected with your allies and just hope that somehow uh, the tipping point will be achieved. So that, that was basically what we, uh, we were able to do. It took many years, but uh, it was uh, suddenly the time when we had uh, the discourse of the future and not the telecommunication systems. I think uh, capacity building probably that was the most important thing. Because you cannot deploy something like uh, the internet with one or two buddies. Actually, you have to have hundreds of people involved in the, in the beginning uh, of the process. And by the middle of the process, let's say five years, you have thousands of people who are capable of uh, uh, deploying networks, uh, training people, using that uh, for application purposes and all. So I would say that capacity building was the key factor. I would say that the internet today is not the kind of benign phenomenon we thought it would be uh, some uh, 25 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, particularly when uh, you had those revelations from uh, Edward Snowden uh, some three years ago, three to four years ago, regarding the way NSA was uh, actually uh, running a full-scale uh, espionage operation. The uh, fact is that the Internet lost uh, its uh, innocence. So that now uh, you have to look at Internet as really an incredibly potential tool, but for good and for bad. And you know that the same internet is being used by NGOs to uh, train people, uh, by uh, national agencies to spy on other governments, by the private sector to implement the business. Which is so the fact is that the uh, internet is not uh, this kind of innocent tool we thought in the beginning. So the main problem for the future is how uh, governments on the one side uh, private sector, NGOs, and society uh, will tackle the issue of the future of the Internet in a way that somehow you can integrate those visions into a single mainstream uh, river, so to say, uh, where all wishes are more or less uh, represented there. I think they have to dream on. Yeah. Uh, they have not to be afraid of uh, going against the uh, uh, the 
the way things are dominant, I would say, and probably uh, striving, yeah. because uh, it takes time. It's nothing that uh, you can do uh, from one night to the other morning or whatever. So uh, uh, I think that's basically what they have to do. And uh, I think uh, the political circumstances in the whole world go against this kind of uh, I mean, behavior, you know. Things are too radical, people talk too much, people I mean, uh, point fingers to each other and so on, so that the overall climate, so to say, is not really uh, very good. But, uh, well, young people are young because of that, because they are there to renew, to learn, to re-educate themselves and so on. So. I would say that uh, uh, that's that. They have to be ambitious. Yeah. Well, uh, it was not really a surprise. It was a disappointment, I would say. But the fact that the internet very soon started to uh, fragment and to become, uh, I mean, the internet of uh, company A the internet of company B, company C, and so on, so that uh, you would have a very uh, interesting discourse about the democracy, about the reaching out to people, and so on. But at the bottom of the line, uh, you would see commercial interests, which are not uh, a sin. But uh, when you, you mix up too much those things, you start to have a situation when you say, well, OK, I'm on internet A, your internet B, even uh, the the interconnection between those services is not so smooth uh, as if you were uh, all the time at Internet B and so on. So this kind of fragmentation or bubbling uh, was something people worried about uh, right from the start. And unhappily, uh, it's uh, getting worse all the time. I think the, the most interesting is this uh, integration between the internet and cell phone, mobile communication. Because uh, prices lower uh, very much so that you can really think about, uh, let's say, within the next 10 to 20 years, uh, most of the world population is going to be connected to internet uh, through mobile at a speed which would be today really uh, I don't know, broadband or something, you know. If you reach that point, then the potential of the internet for good and for bad is going to be something immense. Of course, if, if you have people worried about that, interested in implementing uh, applications in education and so on, the potential to level up uh, the degree of civilization we have is something which is not only talk, it's something really concrete. So. When I look in Brazil at uh, people from all classes in buses and so on, typing in, looking at uh, cell phones, and et, et cetera, uh, then I, I, I see the, the, the concrete potential of these two uh, being uh, raised uh, each day. Uh, and uh, I do hope that within 10 or 20 years, you can really change the face of uh, humankind based upon technology, which is a dream, of course, but uh, you have to dream, right? Well, very complicated, because uh, you have some major uh, actors struggling to have a, a dominant role uh, in the future of the internet. Uh, governments on the one side, and uh, then you have uh, uh, telecom companies, because they are the riverbed, so to say, where water flows. So uh, the point is, uh, well, the water flows here, and we have nothing to do with that other than uh, charging a, a fixed fee. No, we want uh, part in the whole game, and so on. So that uh, the telecom uh, sector will have to evolve in order to satisfy its own needs and also to, uh, to support better the kind of services we're going to have in the future. And then uh, group three is the group of internet companies, which are uh, very intriguing in the sense that uh, when you see the discourse of those large companies, they do no harm, 
uh, the seek the good of humankind and so on, but uh, the final word is always theirs, you know. And that's very complicated because then they say, no, 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 this huge empire is benign, uh, it's not doing any harm and so on, but uh, at the end of the day, who's going to decide uh, whether uh, it's going the right direction on one or two guys, which may, I don't know, may get mad and uh, may whatever and so on. So that when you look at the whole system, you see this role of internet companies, and of course you marvel at what they are being able to do.